Good morning, good morning, everybody. Hi, everyone. This is Jewish Talk coming to you live from NASA Community College, 90.3 WHBC, also streaming on the iHeart and the iTunes app. We can be seen in the studios. I'm waving to everybody. How you doing? I'm on my Facebook Live. I'm on the College Facebook Live here at WHBC. And, of course, our program, if you miss it, you can see it archived on Spreaker.com. So, hi there. My name is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And today, of course, I add, good, happy Hanukkah. And, of course, all depends on when you're listening or watching. Either way, you're always welcome. Listening to us, watching us. Wow, what a great day this is. It's the eve of the great holiday of, guess, guess, it's coming up. It's coming up, Hanukkah. And guess what we're going to be talking about today? You got it. Yom Kippur. No, Hanukkah. It's all about Hanukkah today. And first of all, I want to say welcome to uh, Dr. Kilshevsky, uh, also known as Dr. Kildare. Thank you so much for joining us. Chag Sameach to, uh, let's see now, to Yehuda Klein. And uh, I would like to say a very special happy birthday to Dr. Kilshevsky. Today, Baruch Hashem, like uh, Jack Benny, he is 38 or 39 plus. Happy birthday to you, Doctor, and my best to your whole family, and to everybody listening out there. And, of course, to Joe Sand, Joanne Sands. And uh, from time to time, we'll take a look at those who are watching us. But again, a special welcome to every one of us today as we dedicate our program here for the great eight nights of Hanukkah. And I want to share with you some illuminating points. Uh, no pun intended, but when it comes to Hanukkah, we better be illuminated with inspiring Insights, And if you really want more inspiration, I will take the opportunity, I will take the liberty right now to remind everyone tonight at 7 p.m. begins our Hanukkah Telethon, all dedicated to mental health awareness and helping to, uh, to fund all our programs throughout the year. And uh, tonight from 7 to 11 p.m., it can be seen on the Jewish Broadcasting Service. That is Optimum Altis at Chapter 1, th- Chapter Why? Always rabbis thinking about chapter and verse. It's channel 138. And all the other stations, Fires, Verizon, what, 798, Spectrum, uh, 290. There's there's too many stations for me to announce it. Just if you miss it or you want to make sure or let your friends who are in another part of the country. It can be seen live on our webpage. Everything is taking place. More information at HanukkahTelethon.com. Hanukkah is spelt with a -A C-H-A-N-U-K-A-H. HanukkahTelethon.com So, uh, and as I promised, if I see you watching, I'm going to wave. I'm going to wave. And you really want to make me excited, of course, is to call in and uh, help us and donate and uh, be part of this partnership that all of us have been working so hard for. So let's first, let's go through a number of ideas that come come through my mind on the eve of, of Hanukkah. Let's just get a little bit of a background and uh, I want to say hello to Harvey Kipnis. Good morning to you, Harvey, and my very best to Malka for a speedy, speedy uh, recovery. And um, what, what is this Hanukkah all about? Well, let's begin 22 centuries ago when Israel was under the rule of the empire of Alexander the Great. There was one, and, and at that time, the particular leader uh, of, of that empire was Antiochus. Antiochus. He decided to force the pace of Hellenization and forbidding the Jewish people to practice their religion. And and he actually set up a temple in Jerusalem, in the temple itself. He put up a statue called Zeus Olympus. Now, this was too much to bear. And a group of Jewish people, a.k.a. the Maccabees, they fought for their religious freedom and they won a stunning victory against the most powerful army of the ancient world. And after three years, they conquered Jerusalem and at that point, they rededicated rededicated the temple and relit the menorah with one cruise of undefiled oil that, found, that they found amongst the wreckage. Now, it, it was one of the most stunning military achievements of ancient world. It was, as we say in our prayers, a victory of a few over many, the weak over the strong. And it summed up a wonderful line that we find in uh, the prophet Zechariah that says, not by might, not by strength, but by, by spirit, says the Hashem. And the Maccabees had neither the, the might, nor the strength, neither the weapons, nor the numbers, but they had a double portion of that Jewish spirit that longs for freedom 
and was prepared to fight for it. So never believe that a handful of dedicated people can't change the world. Inspired by faith, they can. The Maccabees did that, and we too can do that today. So the first lesson, of course, is the importance of knowing, of um, standing up, and uh, to put it in a, in a one word is to be inspired by faith. We can be dedicated and we can change the world. Another important idea, the light of spirit never dies. There's an interesting question. The comet days is talk about Hanukkah. Uh, right, this eight-day holiday. For eight days we let the, uh, they light the lights and each night we make a blessing over the miracles. nisin Seinu. But what was the miracle of the first night? I mean, they had a cruise of oil and that was enough for one day. So why are we celebrating seven? It really should be a... Celebrating it for eight days, it should really be a seven-day holiday. So what are, we, what are we making a big deal about the first night? What was the miracle of the first night? The light should have lasted one day. It lasted for eight. But that means there was something miraculous about the two to eight. But there's nothing miraculous about the first day. What they had in hand surely could have lasted that one day. So the kind of miracle kind of kicked in on day two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So perhaps there are many, many answers given to this question. Perhaps the miracle was this, that the Maccabees found one cruise of oil with its seal intact, undefiled. There was no reason to suppose that anything would have survived the systematic decoration, desc- uh, desecration, I should say, of the Greeks and their supporters and what they did to the temple. Yet, they searched, and they searched, and they found that one jar. Why do they even bother? Why do they search? Because they had faith that from the worst tragedies, something would survive. The miracle of the first night was that of faith itself, the faith that something would remain with which to begin again. And let's put it in our practical sense. It's always been this way in our Jewish history. There were times when other people would have given up in despair. After the destruction of the temple or the massacres of the Crusades or the Spanish Inquisition or the pogroms or the Holocaust. But somehow we didn't just sit back and weep. They gathered what remained rebuilt our people, and a light like no other in history, a light that tells us that the world of power of human spirit to overcome, we have the ability to overcome every tragedy and never to, uh, to, to refuse, never to, um, to refuse and, and kind of accept defeat. So from the days of Moses, and remember the famous burning bush, and, uh, and uh, that burnt and, w- and was not consumed to the days of Maccabees, that single cruise of oil, that has been, so to speak, our near tomid, our everlasting light that no power on the earth could extinguish. Uh, hello to Renee Jackson, all the way from uh, the famous Florida. And let's hello to Harold Kornfeld, also from Florida. And from Bluefield, Virginia, Lewis Pushkin. And uh, Jonathan, wow, good morning to you, Jonathan Wolf as well. So um, if you uh, have a question or something you'd like to post on our Facebook or the Facebook of WHBC, we'll be happy to share that with everybody. So let's go now to another thought that comes to mind um, in the holiday of Hanukkah. One of the key phrases of our time is the clash of civilizations. And Hanukkah was about one of the first clashes of civilization between the Greeks and the Jews of antiquity, between Athens and Jerusalem. The ancient Greeks produced one of the most remarkable civilizations of all time. Philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, great historians, dramatists like um, uh, Sokols, and many others. They produced art and architecture, a beauty that, that has never been surpassed. Yet in the second century, before the Common Era, they were defeated by a group of Jewish fighters known as the Maccabees. And from then on, Greece as a world power went into rapid decline. So while the tiny Jewish people um, survived every exile and persecution and are still alive and well today. Moving on. So what was the difference? Why? How come? The Greeks, who did not believe in a single loving God, gave the world the concept of tragedy. We strive, we struggle, and at times we achieve greatness, but life has no ultimate purpose. The universe neither knows nor cares that we are here. Ah, ancient Israel gave the world the idea of hope. We are here because God created us in love, and through love we discover meaning and purpose of life. 
tragic cultures, think about this, right? All the historian buffs out there, uh, history buffs, anything that associate with culture, a culture that's associated with tragedy eventually disintegrates and dies. Lacking any sense of ultimate meaning, they lose the moral beliefs and habits on which continuity depends. They sacrifice happiness for pleasure. They sell the future for the present. They lose the passion and energy that brought them greatness in the first place. That's what happened to ancient Greece. On the other hand, in our world, it's a culture of hope, of, of being able to survive. And those Hanukkah lights that we light tonight, the first candle, are a symbol of what, what survival, of our refusal to throw out our values for the glamour and the prestige of other secular you know, cultures, whether it was then or even now. Look, look at the candle tonight and you'll see a candle of hope. That may be a small thing, but on, on it, the very survival of a civilization may depend. My friends, I hope you're all uh, enjoying and preparing, your menorah's there, and we're discussing with everybody uh, some of the ideas, some of the illuminations that we can think about during each night of Hanukkah. Now, here's an interesting law. Listen carefully. Uh, let me just first say hello to everybody. Thank you for listening. And, of course, those on our Facebook Live want to say hello to Jeff Rosner. Shalom Aleichem, Jeff. Thank you for all of what you do for Jewish life. To Zalman and to Stephen Weitz. Shalom Aleichem, Stephen. I hope your menorah is all prepared for tonight. And um, here's an interesting law. There's a law in Hanukkah that I find very moving and very profound. Maimonides writes that the commandment of lighting the Hanukkah lights is very precious. What would happen if one who lacks money to buy lights, to buy lights, should sell something? Or, if necessary, borrow in order to be able to fill the mitzvah? And here's the question. What happens on Friday afternoon, you find yourself with only one candle? What do you light? This coming Friday is, of course, Hanukkah. And... Of course, Friday night, we, we, we can continue our standard lighting Shabbos candles. What happens if you only have one candle? What do, you, what do you light? Would you light it as the Shabbos candle or as the Hanukkah one? It can't be both. Logic suggests that you should light it as a Hanukkah candle. After all, there's no law that you have to sell or borrow uh, to light lights for Shabbat. Yet the law is that if faced with such a, a choice, guess what? You light it as a Shabbos light. Listen to what Maimonides says. Why would this be? And he explains, because the Shabbat candle, Shabbat light, takes priority because it symbolizes shalom bias, domestic peace. And great is peace because the entire Torah was given in order to make peace in this world. So consider, Hanukkah commemorates one of the greatest military victories in Jewish history. Yet Jewish law rules that if we can only light one candle, the Shabbat candle takes precedence because in our world, the greatest military victory takes seconds, take second place to the peace in the home. So again, why did Judaism, among all the many civilizations of the ancient world, survive? Guess what, my friends? And this, this is very telling. And you can apply it to the world that we live in today. Because we survive because the home is far more important than the battlefield. Marriage, much more than military grandeur. And children, much more than generals. Peace in the home mattered to our ancestors more than the greatest military victory. So here we are, about to celebrate Hanukkah. Spare a thought for a real victory, which was not military, but spiritual. Because we who value marriage, the home, the peace between husband and wife, is above the highest glory that can be accomplished on the battlefield. In our world, the light of peace takes precedence over the light of war. There's another miracle that I want to share with you. And uh, again, please be aware that uh, we are coming to you right out of WHBC, right here at the NASA Community College. And we can be seen on our Facebook, Rabbi Pearl. We all know the miracle of Hanukkah, the military victory as we've been discussing against the Greeks of old. And the miracle of oil that should have lasted only for one day, but it stayed lit for eight days. But there is a third miracle, not that many people don't know about. And it took place several centuries later. 
You see, after the destruction of the second temple, many rabbis were convinced that Hanukkah should be abolished, finished, fatig. After all, we had reclaimed, rededicated the temple, and uh, fine. And now the temple was gone. The temple was gone, and that's where they rededicated. There was no temple anymore. It had been destroyed by Romans under Titus. So it's without, a te- uh, without a temple, what is there left to celebrate? The Talmud tells us that there was one town, Lod, where they decided they wouldn't celebrate Hanukkah at that time. But eventually the other view, that even after the temple was destroyed, we still continue to light our candles. Which is why we dedicate and celebrate Hanukkah to this very day. Why? Because even though the temple was destroyed, what wasn't destroyed was our hope. We, we may have lost buildings, but we still had a story and the memory and the light. And what had happened once in the days of Maccabees is always a possibility again. And therefore, we kept hope alive. That sounds like someone I know, right? We kept hope alive, and hope kept us alive. And that's important as a voice in the, in the conversation of humanity, the importance of having hope. And here comes a very, one of my most favorite insights. And we were discussing this on Shabbat about the different lights. Every holiday is associated with light. For example, when the Jewish people came out of Egypt, it says, mm-hmm. there was light in their homes. Light. When we think about Purim, we say, mm-hmm. there was light at that time. And of course, our holiday of Hanukkah. Now, there is more than one command in Judaism to light lights. There's actually three times in, that we light uh, in the course of our year. There is the Shabbat candles every Friday evening. There is the Havdalah candle that we have on Saturday night. Then, of course, there is the Hanukkah candles. So what's the difference between them? See, it's a fascinating idea. The difference between them is that Shabbat candles represent peace, peace in the home. They are lit indoors. There are, if you like, is um, Judaism's inner light, the light of the sanctity of marriage and the holiness of home. And uh, just to digress for a moment, the importance that we put on marriage and the sanctity of marriage will be on full display this evening on our Hanukkah Telethon as we've, been invi- we've invited back as many couples as possible that I had the great honor uh, to officiate their marriage. And tonight we kick off the official Rabbi Pearl's uh, wedding alumni. You know, there's, there's all kinds of associations uh, that, that deal with, um, so in the professional world, in, in the trades unions, and all kinds of different uh, associations. So I've created, uh, thank God, I stay in touch with all the couples that I had the honor to be a part of their life. And uh, because that's what it's all about. There's holiness, holiness of the home. So the Shabbat candle represents Shalom Bayes, the light of the peace in the home. The Hanukkah candles are is it's usually lit on the outside, outside the front door. It was only because of persecution and difficult times that uh, brought the Hanukkah candle back inside. But in recent times, as we all know, the Lubavitcher Rebbe introduced the custom of lighting giant menorahs in public places to bring us back to the original spirit of the day. So Hanukkah candles are the light of Judaism that brings to the world when we aren't afraid to announce its message, its lesson, and principles to live by, and that is, of course, for our religious freedom. So you have Shabbat candles that fake, speak about the house. The Hanukkah candles, they speak about the impact on the world outside. And then we have the Havdalah candle, which is made up of several wicks woven together. It represents the fusion of the two. What's the two? The inner light of Shabbat joined to the outer light that we make during the six days of the week when we go out into the world and live our faith in public. And that's how the candle, the multiple lights of the Avdala candle, combines both the Shabbat and the weekdays, bringing it all together. So clearly, in our world, our homes must be filled with light, the light of the Divine Presence. And yet when we live and they out, interact with the world out there, our, our role and our, our, import, our important mission is to bring the light of hope to others. And when we live both together, we bring light to the world. So there are two ways to live in a world that is often dark and full of tears. Either we can curse the darkness, 
or we can light a light. And as we often say, a little light derives out much darkness. So may we all help to light up the world tonight. Another important insight uh, that I'd like to share with you in reference to Hanukkah, there's a fascinating argument in the Talmud. Can you take one Hanukkah light to light the others? Now, typically, you can say, what kind, of, what kind of question is that? See, usually, of course, we take an extra light, that's called a shamash, and we use the center taller candle to light up all the other candles. But suppose we don't have, we don't have one. All we have in our hands is two candles. It's the second night. Can we light the first candle and then use it to light the other candles? And this became a debate between two great sages of the third century, Rav and Shmuel, and they disagreed. Rav said, one of the rabbis said, no, you can't do that. Shmuel says you can. Now, usually the rule is that when Rav and Shmuel, these two great sages, argue, disagree, we follow the rules of uh, ruling of Rav. And there are only three exceptions when we listen to Shmuel, and this is one of them. Let me. So why did Rav say that you may not take one candle and light the others? Because he says, when you move that candle over, you're going to diminish. Remember, we talk about candles that uh, at, uh, with oil. Inevitably, you're going to spill some of the wax or the oil. And therefore, he says, don't do anything that would diminish the light of the first. But Shmuel disagrees. And we follow Shmuel's ruling. If you only have two candles, you don't have a third to be the shamash. You can light one and take that first one and move it over to light the second. And the best way of answering this is to think of two personalities, of, of the two worlds. You have two people, both committed and living, living a proper life. A person may say, I, I don't want to get involved with, with the world out there because if I do some of my standards will fall. So I'll, 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 I'll be keeping less. My light will be diminished. That was the view of Rav. The other, Shmuel says, no, when I use the flame of my faith to light a candle in someone else's life, I am in no way being diminished. It actually grows because there's much more now light in the world. When it comes to spiritual goods as opposed to material goods, the more I share, the more I have. If I share my knowledge of faith, in love with others, I won't have less. I may even end up with more. And that, of course, is the view of Shmuel, and that's how the law was eventually decided. So, of course, reminding us all to share, to share this holiday with others, take the flame of your own faith, and help set other souls on fire. We live in a world that's filled with confusion today, anxiety and hatred. Along comes Hanukkah and gives us the gift. What's the gift of Hanukkah? the gift of light. And we have to think as we look at the menorah and to, if you put your ears close to the menorah, not too close to get burnt, you will actually see that the light whispers to us to come closer and listen to its wondrous message. And I hope that uh, as we prepare ourselves for the great holiday, we too have wonderful inspirations to share with our family and friends. And I emphasize the point that uh, when we light the menorah to fulfill the mitzvah properly, we have to eat, actually sit by the menorah, discuss meaningful thoughts, uh, and um, sit there for at least half hour. Yeah, 30 minutes. The only time we don't need to sit by the candlelights, of course, is Friday night. Other, ni- other times, light the menorah, sit there with your family or friends, and discuss the lessons and what the the message of each of the candles represent to us. So there's one other aspect which I really find fascinating is, of course, um, our question was, why was it an eight-day holiday? If they had enough oil for the first day, it should have been a seven-day holiday. The miracle lasted for seven days. They actually had enough oil for one day. And, And... I think one of the uh, uh, meanings for this is, as I mentioned, there are many, many uh, answers given to this. When the Hasmoneans defeated the ancient Greeks, they searched the defiled temple for pure oil, and they found it with the seal of the high priest. And again, they only found one sealed jar, which would be sufficient to burn for one day. But the miracle occurred that the oil continued burning for eight days. 
So again, why do we light up the menorah for eight days? After all, the first day was not a miracle. Should we celebrate it as a seven-day holiday? My friends, it's very simple. Just to go searching for that one jug of oil is a miracle in itself. I guess we've all experienced the feelings of fatigue. A little voice inside of us says to us in our heads, ah, just give it up already. It could be a life stream, a desire to do something great, or to be better, or to live better. We may have a person in our lives who is floundering. It's so much easier to walk away than to continue seeking and pursuing our quest for greatness. And these are many times that I find myself in that frustrated position when I have to deal with things. And sometimes you say, I, listen, being there, done that, I, I can't help. Along comes the miracle of Hanukkah and says, and we learn from the, the Maccabees and the Hasmoneans, we must never stop striving. We must never stop searching for that inner fire. Don't stop trying to find the soul that lies deep within the heart of, all, of ourselves and in others. We should always pursue goodness. It may be a struggle, but do, do, me, a, do me a favor. Don't cast away your dreams and the people that you believe in. Go searching like the Hasmoneans. They could have even waited a whole week and got the fresh, fresh delivery. No, nope, they went searching because they searched and found that miracle. We too will make a difference in finding the goodness in others, never to give up on others. That is why we, this year we chose to, a theme of our telethon is mental health awareness and how sadly we don't give people with that problem enough respect, which means to say we don't, we don't kind of uh, comprehend it properly. We live, walk around with many myths as opposed to the truths. But if you search, we will find in each and every one of us, whoever we may be, has that cruise of oil, that miraculous oil inside of us, ready to be found, ready to be ignited, and ready to serve as a beacon of light. Another important thing, of course, is each night of Hanukkah, as great in the celebration we'll have tonight with one candle, comes tomorrow night, we're going to have two candles. And, of course, we, light, we first light, kindle the newest light from left to right. And each night we add a new candle until the final evening when the entire menorah is aflame. We go up in numbers. The increase of lights demonstrates that the enormity of the miracle that increased each night. On a deeper level, the oil refers to wisdom of the heart and the mind. And interestingly, when the Greeks came in, the ancient Greeks came in, they didn't simply uh, destroy the building. They touched all the oil. I mean, they didn't look to dis destroy the oil. They came and allowed the oil to exist, but with that kind of Greek touch. The Greeks defiled not only the oil, but the hearts and the thoughts. They sought to deny us the hearts and thoughts of what we should be in. And it's, it was a, there was a possibility of falling into the trap, into a, a, a foreign kind of thinking. What did we learn from Hanukkah? We found one pure, unadulterated um, jar, of, jar of oil. It was one remnant of truth, one spark of eternal divine holiness that never stopped. And with this strength, we were able to hold on to our sacred mission and to grow into a great nation. And of course, as we know, we, did not, we never have ever lost the soul of the nation. Hanukkah reminds us, just keep going, keep growing, keep studying, keep striving to make the world a better place. And that is, my friends, how important it is, how sad it is to simply coast in life. To be the same person when we were five or ten years ago, never developing, never transforming ourselves. So the menorah says to us, keep, keep challenging our minds and our hearts. Add light to your life each and every day. Delve into the wisdom of Judaism. Nourish your soul that you will flourish as a human being to be greater, to be greater tomorrow than ever. So, my friends, time has grabbed us, but I want to wish you all thank you, wishing you a happy Hanukkah, enjoy it with your family and friends. Don't forget to watch our Hanukkah Telethon this evening, HanukkahTelethon.com, for all the details. And, of course, on Wednesday, we're having a great com comedian come to our Chabad house. Enjoy us. For more information, give us a call, 516-739-3636. See you later, everybody. Waving. Take care.